Hello, child of the United Colonies of Mankind. I am your neurally intelligent teaching assistant, or Anita for short. Since you are unable to attend classes with your fellow students during your trip to your new home, I have been assigned to teach you several important subjects. Today's subject is history. We will get into specifics later, but for now, I will give you a lesson of the overall history of humanity and the current state of the galaxy. The late 21st century was a time of great unrest for humanity. Social unrest, wealth disparity, and the threat of nuclear war racked civilization, and many wondered if this was the beginning of the end times. It was thought that everything humanity had accomplished would be destroyed due to the species' inability to simply get along. And perhaps it would have all ended if not for the invention of nuclear fusion. Humanity had mastered what powered the very stars, and that source of almost free, limitless power would change humanity forever. With the limitless power provided by their new fusion generators, the world changed. First, the change was rather overt. Humanity started changing the planet. They began massive geoengineering projects to reverse the damage caused by climate change, deforestation, and other environmental impacts. While the world was being changed, so was humanity. Over time, the concept of separate governmental entities, and even nations, became unnecessary. Humanity needed a global system to handle the various monumental projects being done, and the past 200 years had clearly shown that nationalism can lead to rather unfortunate consequences. Eventually, humanity formed a world government to handle global affairs, one that would eventually be known as the EAA, or the Earth Administration Authority. With the world and society changed for the better, it was time to explore the next frontier, space. With fusion technology at its core, humanity soon produced a spatial distortion and manipulation drive, or full space drive for short, a technology which allowed humans to travel between the stars. Initially, Travel through fold space was inaccurate to say the least. It was determined that it was impossible to go to a specific location in space. Any attempt to do so usually had the ship appear several light months or even years from the desired location. It was soon discovered that in order to create more accurate routes, a ship needed to lay down a device called a fold space node to act as a beacon for future flights. Of course, finally arriving at a world to lay the first beacon was the hard part. And thus, the number of habitable worlds discovered by humanity were sadly few. Who knows how many centuries it would have taken to discover a substantial number of suitable worlds, if not for the arrival of our first alien contact. A diminutive race covered head to toe in translucent white spines, and with large heads containing wide eyes, it became a shock to many that these beings resembled aliens that had appeared in pulp culture for centuries a shock that disappeared when the aliens explained. Easily speaking our language and understanding our culture, it seems this species had been observing humanity for a while, simply waiting for us to rise above our baser instincts and join them in the stars. As for what to call them, the aliens asked that humanity simply call them friends. And as a sign of good faith, the friends guided humanity to lush worlds that were surprisingly close to our solar system a cluster of worlds now known as the Cradle Worlds. Despite their gracious gifts, it soon became clear that the Friends had ulterior motives. It seemed the Friends were simply one tribe of a larger race called the Shaltari. This race was split into various tribes that constantly competed and warred with each other, and the Friends wished to use humanity as foot soldiers against other tribes, expendable foot soldiers so that they can save precious Shaltari lives. As thankful as they were for the friend's aid, humanity decided to decline, and the relationship between humanity and the Shaltari tribe known as the Friends quickly soured. Expansion continued, and although new worlds were slowly discovered, no worlds were ever as perfect for human life as the Cradle Worlds. Eventually, a cultural split began to form. The Cradle Worlds became the seats of civilization, hubs of culture, technology, and entertainment that were administered by the gentle, if a bit constraining hand of the EAA. 
The newly discovered but usually much more distant worlds on the other hand tended to lack the idyllic climates of their cradle world counterparts. However, they were extremely resource rich. Thus these frontier worlds tended to attract much more independently minded colonists. Entrepreneurs, desperados, miners, and so on. Those individuals who wanted to try their hands on these new worlds without having to deal with the full weight of EAA bureaucracy. Over time, the cradle worlds began to view the frontier world as hives of scum and villainy, places without the benefits of laws and civilization. As for the frontier worlds, they viewed the cradle world as decadent and slothful, caring more for the next bit of pleasure than anything of substance. Although there was tension, the EAA was able to keep the peace, and humanity may have simply evolved past this next shift in their cultural evolution. However, the galaxy would ensure humanity would not get that chance. In the year 2506, a small object fell from the sky and landed in a field of what was then known as Peru. Detected by EAA planetary sensors, the object's crash site was quickly located and what the search teams found was a small white spherical object about the size of a tennis ball. Despite its small size, however, it was extremely dense and required at least two people to carry. Brought into a nearby lab, numerous tests were done on the object. It was discovered that no known substance could penetrate it. And even stranger still, although the object was cool to the touch, all sensors clearly showed the object as being so hot, it should have melted anything it was placed upon. After six weeks with no successes, a device with a direct link to a network computer was attached to the spear in what was supposed to be one of a new series of tests. Seconds after contact, the facility went into lockdown and all personnel found themselves locked in whatever room they happened to be in. Worse yet, across the South American continent, all computers with access to the worldwide net were shut out, allowing plenty of bandwidth for the spear to upload vast quantities of data. After a few minutes, the transfer ceased and, a few hours later, the facility's personnel, still stuck in various rooms, heard the sounds of explosions and engines. Once they were finally able to leave their rooms, they discovered a massive hole in the wall and the spear missing. Days later, a message was broadcast through hacked devices across all the cradle worlds simultaneously. Here is a recording of the English message. A time of dire fortune is nigh. Your race stands upon a knife's edge. An implacable foe approaches, against which you have insufficient time to prepare and no hope of victory. We implore you to abandon your home planet and those nearest to it. Join us over Vega 4 in one year hence and we will guide you to your salvation. Fail, and only death awaits you." Some simply saw this as an extensive prank or simple scaremongering, but with the EAA unable to explain the sophisticated hack or the source of the strange message, tensions rose across the cradle worlds. Looting, panic, and chaos began to rise. And over time, especially closer to the deadline, the numbers of stolen fold space capable ships and mutinies across EAA battleships increased substantially. These abandonists, as they began to be called, advocated the following of this strange message and justified any actions in pursuit of this goal as necessary for their survival. Days before the deadline, an EAA battle fleet took up station over Vega 4, an uninhabited rocky world in a system between Earth and the Cradle Worlds. Although I say battle fleet, it was nothing like the battle fleets of the United Colonies of Mankind today. Back then, EAA ships as well as the ground-based military were more of a peacekeeping force than anything else, a fact that became sorely obvious as the battle fleet found themselves outnumbered by thousands of civilian ships and a few mutinous military vessels. With orders not to immediately engage the abandonists but also not allow the mass exodus, both fleets waited nervously as the timer ticked down to the mysterious message's deadline, and at the precise moment the clock struck zero, a text message was sent to every abandonous vessel. We advise you to proceed to the coordinates we have loaded. 
we have made your drives accurate. You have made the right choice. After that message, a data spike was detected being sent to every abandonous vessel, and ships across its fleet started powering up their fold space drives, winking out of existence. When the EAA ordered the ships to stand down or be fired upon, Many of the abandoned ships capable of doing so opened fire instead, shooting first to protect their fellow ships on their journey to worlds unknown. Unprepared for such an act, the EAA fleet took devastating losses before returning fire, aiming to destroy the firing ships. As more ships escaped, and the volume of fire soon favored the EAA, the battle fleet began firing on any ships that had not yet escaped into fold space. It is not known how many actually died in that conflict, but it is estimated that over 10 million human lives were lost in the first civil war to ever occur in space. With half of the EAA fleet crippled and depleted of munitions, the fleet crawled back to Earth for relief and repairs. What those exhausted Navy crewmen and humanity as a whole were soon to discover, however, was that the worst was yet to come. Two days after the Battle of Vega, a vast number of alien ships were detected heading towards Earth, and the EAA fleet, already devastated by the Battle of Vega, stood no chance. Sweeping through the now utterly broken fleet, the ships flew into low Earth orbit and unleashed dropships into the planet's major cities. Some disgorging sinister looking battle tanks that spewed hot plasma that burned EAA tanks into molten metal, and more unsettling, on the occasion when a tank was destroyed by the lucky strike of an EAA vehicle, no crew was ever observed escaping, only a thick black tar that flowed from the vehicle like blood from an open wound. From other dropships spewed out what was then assumed to be the hostile alien race, lizard-like humanoids with pale skin dressed in thick garments, and with eyes that radiated malice and hate. These aliens fought with reckless abandon, with no thought to their own lives. Soon enough, the EAA found itself completely overwhelmed. When it became obvious that Earth stood no chance, the exodus began. Any ships capable of faster than light travel quickly began leaving the planet, many of them trying desperately to grab as many of their fellow humans as possible before they did. Of those that were able to escape and fold space to nearby cradle worlds, they saw similar scenes of horror. It seemed that all of the cradle worlds the seat of humanity's government and culture were being attacked in a coordinated strike. In desperation, many ships chose to travel past the remaining cradle worlds and head straight to the frontier worlds, and when they arrived, they could only wait, dreading the arrival of an enemy that thankfully never came. For whatever reason, the great enemy focused on the cradle worlds, uninterested in, or perhaps unable to, reached the frontier worlds beyond. With time to take stock of the situation, the survivors began to review what they knew. They studied the corpses of the aliens they carried with them. The beings seemed lizard-like in appearance and had biology similar to terrestrial life forms. However, one oddity was their nervous systems, which, as far as scientists could tell, did not seem to share the same chemistry as the rest of the body. Another oddity was the aliens' behavior. Although the aliens' assault seemed well-planned, exploiting various EAA weaknesses, the aliens on the ground seemed more like rage-filled monsters. The brutality of the attack, as well as the extreme loss of life that occurred, eventually gave this horrendous alien species a name, the Scourge. The next 160 years began a time of great growth for the remaining humans in the frontier worlds. The great influx of refugees and an increased birth rate turned former fringe colonies into thriving, developed, prosperous civilizations. The vast mineral resources the worlds were known for feeding the continuing development of major cities and industry. All of this would not have been possible without the establishment of a multi-planet federation formed soon after the exodus now known as the United Colonies of Mankind, or UCM. 
a government that advocated cooperation and fraternity in the face of a common enemy. This new superstate became militant in nature. Under its leadership, armament production and military training reached a level not seen since the war-torn 22nd century, and resources were poured into technological development to ensure the military had the best weaponry available. And when it was determined that humanity had developed enough to stand against the scourge, the UCM decided to fight back. Before that could be done, however, reconnaissance was necessary. Newly crafted stealth-capable ships were sent out to observe the state of the old cradle worlds. These were dangerous missions, not only for fear of alien attack, but the ship's captains were ordered to self-destruct if there was even a chance that the Scourge could capture their vessel. Humanity could not risk the enemy discovering the coordinates of the fold space nodes of the frontier worlds. Those ships that were able to report back told of a great discovery. Although all space-based nodes were destroyed by the Scourge in the first assault on the Cradle Worlds over a century ago, several planet-based nodes were still operational. Since it was impossible for such devices to still be working on their own after over a century, it could only mean they were still being maintained. More information was needed. Ground insertion teams were sent to the Cradle World of Jericho, and in one of the devastated cities, Human survivors were discovered, and the story they told those soldiers were horrifying. After the mass exodus, those humans left behind continued to resist the alien invaders. As the fighting continued, they began to notice that some of their fellow humans were fighting alongside the Scourge. At first disgusted by these apparent collaborators, they began to notice that these humans began to share the same unhealthy pale skin and reckless attack patterns of the alien invaders. Through examination of several human collaborator corpses, the Resistance discovered the horrible truth. These collaborators shared the same abnormal nervous system as the lizard-like humanoids, indicating the true enemy was an alien race that used sentient species for their own dark purposes. Over time, as the lizard-like humanoids' bodies wore out, the number of human scourges rose up to replace them, until the Resistance found themselves fighting the resurrected forms of friends family, and allies. The Scourge were parasites and they aimed to turn the rest of humanity into the next series of mindless, loyal soldiers. With the discovery of survivors, it was decided that the nuclear annihilation of Scourge-occupied worlds was no longer an option. Not only was it inconceivable to kill so many of their fellow humans still resisting the Scourge, but doing so would leave the Cradle Worlds uninhabitable for future generations. Thus, the battle with the Scourge must be fought with battle fleets and boots on the ground. And with that, the planning for the reconquest began. After years of planning, the UCM High Council deemed humanity ready to begin their assault against the Scourge. Yet, on the eve of the invasion, a small ship of unknown design arrived near the main battle fleet. Although the ship appeared human in origin, it was much sleeker than the more utilitarian designs of the UCM. Declaring themselves non-hostile and requesting an audience, the ship was allowed onto the heavy cruiser Rubicon, and its crew was led to the planning room of the UCM High Council. Those who arrived were physically human, but had a unearthly cast to their features. Something about the way they moved and their appearance seeming to be off to those that observed them, and the visible skin beneath their simple white clothing reflected silver circuitry which indicated some form of unknown bionic enhancements. Although their appearance was unnerving, it was their words that were truly shocking. The full dialogue between these individuals and the UCM High Command is available in a public record, but the basic gist is that these individuals were the descendants of the Abandonists who had crippled the EAA fleet before leaving for parts unknown. Now calling themselves the Post-Human Republic, or PHR, they had come to warn humanity against continuing their plans, stating it was foolish and would lead to unnecessary bloodshed, something the UCM High Council did not appreciate hearing. The UCM viewed the PHR as the descendants of cowards who left humanity weak when it faced its greatest challenge in history. The PHR viewed the UCM as the descendants of fools, who didn't leave with the Abandonists when they had a chance to escape the coming of the Scourge. Both sides refused to give an inch, and let's just say a few harsh words were exchanged. 
the PHR delegation were allowed to leave, and the UCM High Council continued their plans to retake the cradle worlds of humanity. Any chance for a reconciliation between these two factions of humanity unlikely for the foreseeable future. 20 hours after that tense meeting, the reconquest began. A military campaign that continues to this day. And you may find yourself an important part of once you reach recruitment age. Child of the United Colonies of Mankind Today's lesson is over as it is now time for your scheduled dinner time. Please head to the ship's mess to receive your meal and we will continue further lessons tomorrow. Hey guys, I hope you liked this video on the lore and story of Drop Fleet and Drop Zone Commander. Uh, this wonderful space opera war game. If you like it, please like. Subscribe, comment, press the little bell so you know we're on our posts, etc. And if you really like it and you're inclined, please send a little money my way to my Patreon and my coffee account. The extra money gives me the time I need to work on these stories I love. Anyway, if, thanks for everything and uh, see you next time.